Let's open with number 430. 430. We switched up the order. Eric will be the keynote speaker this afternoon. O Master, when thou callest, no voice may say thee nay, for blessed are they that follow, where thou dost lead the way. In freshest prime of morning or fullest glow of noon, the note of heavenly warning can never come too soon. Warm, yeah, warning. Uh, just the first three verses of 430. ask God's blessing on the ministry meeting. Our Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to open your word together and uh, the privilege we had of remembering the Lord and the way he appointed for us this morning. We ask for help as we would look into the scriptures, uh, Brother Eric and myself, as well as the Sunday school downstairs. We pray, pray your blessing upon the children and upon the teachers and ask your blessing upon the gospel tonight. All these activities we would commit to you and give thanks again for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn to Second Chronicles, chapter 22. If I say the name Jehoiada, what comes to mind? Who's Jehoiada? I, I thought about a show of hands. Was he a king of Israel or a king of Judah? Or neither. <laughs> he's neither. <clears throat> I, I think he's, uh, I've been reading through this, and I, I think he's an unsung hero uh, that doesn't really get a lot of press. <clears throat> and uh, as I read through this little section here, it's a pretty big section, um, I really was impressed with this man, and I thought he should be in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the heroes of faith on that wall, plaque on that wall. And I looked, and he wasn't there. But he is there, because the writer of the Hebrews says, but time doesn't allow for all the others that I could mention. So he's mentioned under that umbrella, <clears throat> Jehoiada, the priest. Um, but we've got to get a little bit of background, <clears throat> and um, we're going to start. I'm, I tried to condense my reading. It's, uh, I'd love to read the whole thing, and you can, if, I hope I pique your interest on this man, and you can read it at home. It's also in uh, Second Kings. A little more detail, a little less. Um, the Chronicles is kind of like the judgment seat of Christ. It's God's view of things. 
So this is kind of a, um, not so much condensed, but a little, a slightly different angle on Jehoiada and the surrounding characters. Let's start at chapter 22 and verse 1. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem <clears throat> made Ahaziah his youngest son, and his uh, youngest, it's the youngest son of uh, Jehoram, who was an evil king, made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place for the band of men that came from the Arabians to the camp had killed the older sons, so Ahaziah the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. Omri was the father of Ahab, not a good character. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor in doing wicked, wickedly. That's Athaliah, his mother. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as the house of Ahab have done. For after the death of his father, they were his counselors to his undoing. So that's kind of the background. That's this, <clears throat> you're introduced to Athaliah. Uh, then let's drop down to verse 10. <clears throat> now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, who by now, remember, he only reigned one year, he was killed. <clears throat> Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. She arose and destroyed all the royal family of the house of Judah. That's her own family, by the way. This isn't <laughs> a distant family. But Jehoshaphat, Beath, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were about to be put to death, and she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus uh, Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, that's our man, the priest. Uh, sorry, let me read this in a coherent way. Uh, <laughs> so excited to see Jehoiada's name that I. <clears throat> Thus Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, because she was a sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not put him to death. And he remained with them six years, hidden in the house of God, while Athaliah reigned over the land. Okay, <clears throat> so just to, I'm, don't, don't fear, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I've just got to pick out some highlights. Chapter 23, verse 1. But in the seventh year, Jehoiada took courage and entered into the, a covenant with the commanders of, the, of hundreds. And then there's a bunch of their names. <clears throat> Verse 2, and they went about through Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of the fathers of the house of Israel. And they came to Jerusalem and all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And Jehoiada, of course the king was seven, <clears throat> and Jehoiada said to them, behold the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. This is the thing that you shall do. If you priests and Levites come off duty, and then I'm not going to read it, but they, he had this elaborate secret plan to amass quite a large army of priests by because they would come in shifts, right? And he said, when the shift is leaving, don't leave. And the shift that comes, you're going to stay, and the new shift's going to come early. So they had quite an army. That's the method they took. <clears throat> um, but we won't read it. We'll drop down to verse 8. The Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they each brought his men who were to go off duty on the Sabbath with those that were to come on duty on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss the divisions that Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains, the spears and the, uh, and the large and small shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he set all the people as a guard for the king, every man with his weapon in his hand. You don't normally think of priests as being warriors, but here they are. Every man with his weapon in his hand from the south side of the house, the north side of the house, and the altar. Then they brought out the king, the king's son, and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. That's the word of God. And they proclaimed him king. Jehoiada, his sons, anointed him, and they said, Long live the king. Um, well, we have to keep reading. Then Athaliah. When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. <clears throat> and when she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters besides the king and all the people of the land rejoicing 
and blowing trumpets and the singers and their musical instruments leading in the celebration. And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains who were set over the army, saying to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with a sword for the priest. For the priest said, Do not put her to death uh, in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went into the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, and they put her to death there. And Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they should be the Lord's people. Then all the people went to the house of Baal and tore it down and the altars and images, and they broke the, to pieces, and they killed Matin, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And Jehoiada posted watchmen for the house of the Lord under the direction of the Levitical priests and the Levites whom David had organized to be in charge of the house of the Lord to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing according to the order of David, he stationed the gatekeepers at the gates of the house of the Lord so that no one should enter who was in any way unclean. And he took the captains, the nobles, the governors, the people, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord, marching through the upper gate to the king's house, and they set the king on the royal throne. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword. <clears throat> the first four verses of 24, I'm almost done. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jeho Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada got hit for him two wives, and he had sons and daughters. After this, Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord. And he goes on to explain how he financed it, all the work they did to restore the dilapidated temple. Tremendous time. Uh, drop down to verse 13. <clears throat> uh, 12. And the king and Jehoiada uh, gave it, that's the money, to those who were in charge of the work of the house of the Lord and the hired masons, the carpenters, etc. Verse 13. So those who were engaged in the work, labored and repaired, went forth, and they restored the house of God to its proper condition and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money and they made all kinds of vessels and things. Now, <clears throat> um, the end of verse uh, 14, and they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord regularly all the days of Jeho Jehoiada. But Jehoiada grew old and full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old at his death. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. It's very unique. Because he had done good in Israel and toward God in his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord and the God of their fathers and served the ashram, etc. Uh, he crashed and burned immediately after the death of Jehoiada. He's assassinated <coughs> uh, halfway through, near the end of the chapter. In verse the last verse we'll read here is verse 25. Um, the end of verse 25. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. Just two more verses. One in Psalm 115. I think Dan read this the other day. Psalm 115 and verse 1. This verse summarizes the life of Jehoiada. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And the other verse, and this summarizes Joash's life, is 2 John chapter, uh, verse 8. It says, Wash yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teachings of both the Father and the Son, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him. So, uh, in 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you why I'm so impressed with Jehoiada. He's one of the men... <clears throat> after this little study that I really, I want to line up 
someday and meet and talk to him. Um, I'd like to split my little talk uh, into, into really four areas. His priorities, his character, <clears throat> his actions, and his wisdom. Um, I want you to think about <clears throat> this man. So he died at 130 years old. And he died a year, a year before Joash died. Joash was 47 when he died. So Jehoiada was in his late 80s when this story starts. You don't read of Jehoiada until he's probably 83 years old, 83, 84 years old, depending on when their birthdays were. So here's a man that is in oblivion, as far as scriptures go, until he's 83 years old. <clears throat> and you don't need calculus to do this math. It's right on the page. <clears throat> um, so the, one of the first lessons I learn is that it's never too late to serve God, right? 83 years old. And this isn't when people live at 800 years or 900 years. He lived to a very old age at 130 years old. This is well past the time when it says that the life of man will be seven or uh, Three score and ten, sometimes four score. Eighty years, typical. So he was a very old man. <clears throat> so here he was, and he didn't develop this character that we're going to talk about when he was 83. This is a man that lived with correct priorities, correct uh, convictions for 83 years. I don't know when he embraced the Lord, but for many, many, many years, and he's in oblivion. But just at the right time, God brings them forth. And so I think that's encouraging to all of us. There's, you know, you might think I've, I've never really been called to do anything big. And, and maybe big is not the right word. Something for God that God has specifically fit you for. Well, Jehoiada didn't get his assignment until he was 83 years old. That's just a side. Uh, there's a few things I learned before we get into the man. And that is, and that's the reason I read about Ahaziah at the beginning and who his mother was. Boys, be careful who you marry. And that's one of the lessons from this, all of Chronicles. Be careful who you marry. Every single king, when it introduces him, it says, and his mother's name was so-and-so. And it says he either did right in the eyes of the Lord or did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And in this one, we're told specifically why Ahaziah did evil in the eyes of the Lord is because his mother was an evil woman. His mother was a a daughter, a granddaughter of Omri, or a daughter of Ahab, right? What was a, a, a king of Judah marrying a daughter of Ahab from Israel? Enemies. But he did. And here was the result. Be careful who you marry. And the reason it always says, and his mother's name was, is because who has more influence over children than the mother? In typical family. So uh, Ahaziah was an evil man. And, and we also read that Jehoiada chose wives for Joash. He wasn't going to leave that up to chance because his father uh, chose very poorly, right? Or his grandfather chose very poorly. So uh, Jeho uh, Jehoiada, he was planning, not only did he, was he concerned about what was happening now, but he was planning for future generations. That's another lesson that we learned. When in, in, in assembly life, in, this, in the kingdom of God, we don't just be, we're not just concerned about what's happening now, we're concerned about the next generation. And that's the first thing, um, one of the first things about Jehoda that I'm impressed with is that he, he was a planner. He was a man that had vision. Okay, so a seven-year-old, he, he, he saw potential in a seven-year-old. Well, of course, this was not any old seven-year-old, this was the only royal family of the house of David left. Okay, so Satan was trying to stamp out again the royal line of David, <clears throat> but he was, he was foiled by this wise woman who hit a one-year-old and a wise priest who raised a seven-year-old to be a tremendous king. <clears throat> well, let's just think real quick about the priorities of Jehoiada. That was my first thing. We read that, well, the, his priority was to have the rightful king on the throne, and these are all very, very practical things that we can apply to ourselves. Who's my king? Who's, who's the throne on the throne of my life? The rightful king 
or this king. Jehoiada was a man of tremendous influence and power. He never exploited it. He could have been king. Jehoiada seemed to be the leader of the, the, uh, the, uh, the house of Judah. Because he, he, he had tremendous influence. When he said do, people did. When he said come, people came. And when he said kill her, people killed her. This man could have been king, but he never exploited that. He wanted the correct man to be on the throne. He valued the word of God. The first thing he says, they put him, they, they set the king and the testimony. So I don't know how much the seven-year-old was going to read the word of God, but the, the imagery is, is, is unmistakable. The word of God was prominent in the, in the eyes of Jeho uh, Jehoiada and his priorities. The house of God was prominent. Think of the assembly. <clears throat> it was huge in Jehoiada's. He influenced Joash to restore the house of God, which Athaliah had raided and, and, uh, and exploited. All the value of the house of God. She'd sold things and used things for uh, the house of uh, Baal. No, Jehoiada valued the word of God, the house of God, the people of God. He said, we need to be the people of God again. He valued worship. It says the sacrifices were offered. We read this. Sacrifices were offered all the days of Jehoiada, the priest. So they, they reinstated the sacrifices because they rebuilt the altar. They rebuilt the house of God. And they re-established uh, the Levitical priest activity and the guards and the singers and all those things. Jehoiada, that was all Jehoiada's planning. You say, well, if, you, if I read it carefully, it says Joash did this. If you want to know what Jehoiada valued, watch the life of Joash because he was Joash's mentor. And everything... Basically, Joash did everything he said. It always says Joash and Jehoiada, Joash and Jehoiada, right? And as soon as Jehoiada is out of the picture, Joash crashes and burns. It was the, if you want to know Jehoiada's priorities, just look at the life of Joash. Those are his priorities. <clears throat> his character. His character was he was ready to serve God, and he waited a long time, right? That's, that's a tremendous thing. He had patience. Um, he saw potential in youth. That's something that I think is very, very practical. How do I view the young men, the young sisters in this assembly? Do I see them as the future, as valuable, as having tremendous future uh, potential for God? That's what Jehoiada saw in Joash. He saw potential. And talk about crossing generations. Here's a ninth, well, yeah, 93 years old or so when he took this seven-year-old under his wing. And this is a... Uh, this is a married man, so uh, we don't know uh, how many children he had, but he had his own children. They, of course, they would have been grown by this point, uh, because we read that Jehoiada's sons, and later Joash killed one of Jehoiada's sons because he prophesied against him. That's the reason he was killed. We didn't read it. So he, he crossed generations, and that's something that's, I think, a tremendous lesson. We should, we should have friends across all generations as believers. An assembly is a body, an assembly is a family, and we shouldn't be separated by age groups and uh, generations. And I, I, I love the fact that in this assembly there are, I, I see cross-generational relationships. That's Jehoiada. <clears throat> so he bridged generations. He exemplified Psalm 115. I already kind of mentioned this. Unto you, O Lord, be glory, not unto me. He said, we're going to be the people of God, not the people of Jehoiada, not the people of the king, the people of God. So he, he exemplified that. Never, never brought glory to himself. It's an amazing thing. He, again, he was a man of tremendous influence and power, but never, ever exploited it. That's a great lesson. Whenever you have authority or influence, we have to point to the Lord. We have to, we have to uh, take people's eyes, never to ourselves, but to the Lord. Um, and I, I already said he valued God's people. Uh, let's think about his actions. And I'm going to move quick here because I want to talk about Joash too. His actions, his actions, he made the king king. He restored the house of God. He made a covenant with the people. He uh, planned for future kings because he made sure that there was the two wives, and we're not going to talk about polygamy in the Old Testament, but... He made sure there was going to be a future king in David's line in Israel, in Judah, because he chose the wives. 
And they're both from Jerusalem. Whenever you read about a man whose mother's name was so-and-so and and she was from Jerusalem, he's a good king. Right? So there's there's a lot of typology there. So you chose a a wife who had, who valued uh, the law and valued the house of God. She lived in Jerusalem. Uh, Let's talk... uh, Let's talk about his wisdom real quick. I read this because it says, after they got the house restored, he set up the guards, he set up the gatekeepers, he set up guardrails. He saw the destruction that Athaliah had uh, created and, and, the, and the effect it had upon the people of God and the nation. And he didn't want that to happen again. So he set up correct boundaries. And that is something I think is very, very um instructive to us. An assembly uh, can be destroyed in a generation by wrong teaching, by people that are brought in that aren't saved. He said they had gatekeepers to make sure that nothing that defiled entered. So God is very, very jealous. We're going through the, the churches of Asia right now. You can see how the Lord walked among the candlesticks. He's very interested in what's going on. We need to be very interested. If he's interested, we need to be interested in protecting and guarding uh, the house of God. And that's what Jehoiada showed his wisdom in resetting up, the, really, the wisdom of God and protecting the uh, future of the, uh, the house of God. <clears throat> um, I just want to really quickly, giving uh, plenty of time for Eric, talk about Joash. What happened to Joash? He had a really good start. Dan preaches pretty often on finishing well. Here's a man who didn't finish well. He is the poster child for not finishing well. So he started at seven, and who's got convictions at seven, right? He was he was a you know he was hidden for the first seven years of his life. So here he is put under the tutelage of Jehoiada, a tremendous man of God, and he reigns till he's 46 years old. Well, no, 47 years old. So he must have been died when he was 48 because he lived one year after Jehoiada. He reigned 40 years. And during those 40 years, they did tremendous things. They rebuilt the house of God. They reestablished the priesthood, the sacrifices. Uh, he, he won battles. Tremendous. Um, what a great king. It says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, with a caveat, all the days of Jehoiada the priest. He was living the convictions of Jehoiada. Joash clearly never developed his own convictions. That's why I read in John 2 and verse 8. He says, watch yourself so that everything... And let me read it again because it's, it's, so, it's, it's so typical or really illust, illust, illustrative of this life we just talked about. <clears throat> uh, John 2 and verse 8 says... Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. He lost it all. They, if you read the next chapter or two, they, they lost all the vessels that he created. The house of the Lord got pillaged. He lost battles. He lost everything in one year that it took 40 years to build. He actually killed Jehoiada's son, who was also a priest and a prophet, that came and testified against him. He said, the Lord's going to reject you because you rejected him. And they killed him. And that's why he was killed. That's why Joash was killed. This is a warning to all of us. Was there anything wrong with the way Joash was living for 40 years when he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord? No, it was excellent. The scriptures say he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But why was he doing it? He was doing it because he was under good influence. But evidently, he never created, he never developed his own personal convictions. And that's something that's, that's very easy for us to, to be in a, in, a, in a good environment with good peers and good teaching, an assembly that, as far as we can tell, is, is following the Word of God. And so we're being obedient. And we're living a life accordance with the word of God. But if it's not my own convictions, and I haven't studied the word of God for myself, he was given the testimony. Joash was given the testimony. I wonder if he ever read it. 
They were required, actually. Kings were required to read the book of the law when they became a king. I wonder if you ever read it. If he did, he didn't take it seriously because as soon as Jehoiada died, he literally crashed and burned. So I don't want to be pessimistic or negative. I don't anticipate that for anybody here. But all of us, all of us are in danger of living a little bit on other people's convictions and, and performing rather than doing what we do out of conviction and service and devotion to the Lord Jesus and to God the Father. So that's something that to think about in your own life. Get into the Word of God, and when you're reading the Word of God, be convinced this is what God is saying to me. This is not just what Mr. Valance and Alex Joyce taught us, and Mr. Stewart, and Mr. Barr. This is what the Word of God is teaching me now, and I believe it, and I'm going to live for the Lord because of the Lord and because of, of what I'm reading in His Word. Jehoiach Jehoi never did that, evidently, and he, he lost everything. He was not even buried with the kings. This is like the judgment seat of Christ. He lost everything. Jehoiada was buried. The only priest we ever read was buried as a king. Jehoiada heard, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He was buried. He took the place of Joash effectively because he really lived the life that Joash, Joash was just living the life of Jehoiada. So anyways, I want you to uh, be impressed by Jehoiada. I am, and I want to meet him someday. May God bless his word. First Corinthians 15, please. First Corinthians 15. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon and to visit with everyone promise there will be no difficult king's names or pronunciations during my portion of the meeting, as I realize I stand between you and probably whatever your lunch plans are. So I mean to be simple, and this is a topic that's been on my heart for some time, and um, it'll fit, I think, with the recent celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but I intend to make it more practical. So 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read just a few verses, and then we're going to conclude, conclude near the end of the chapter. So 1 Corinthians 15 and 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now turn down toward the end of the chapter and look down at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this imperishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality, and so on. Look down to verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now my text is this, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I'm glad Jeff asked to go first because I believe our messages will be very complimentary. I want to talk about being steadfast and being immovable and all of these things that go with this verse that we've just been considering. But as we were wrapping up uh, some of the readings in Cleveland, about 1 Corinthians and, and wrapping that up. And we got to the end of that chapter. I got to thinking to myself, all of these things about the Lord Jesus that he's reminding them of, he then turns to this wonderful verse that we have here, considering everything that's gone before about their Savior. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he died. 
He rose again the third day. All of these things. He has taken them to the pinnacle of the gospel, and then he is going to turn their attention to the fact that that gospel and that that they have received, that those truths have a practical outcome upon each one of us as well. I might ask you if you've heard of a man by the name of Ernest Shackleton. That's probably, by the way, the hardest name I have to pronounce. And so if you don't know who Ernest Shackleton was, he was an explorer in the early 19th, or excuse me, uh, 20th century. And he was the first one really known for discovering and conquering and um, going through Antarctica. And this man was so revered in his country, after he had made several journeys, they needed men to be called out for a journey to Antarctica. So as the saying goes, and there may be some folklore that goes with this, but there was an advertisement that was placed. And it said the following, men needed for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, months of complete darkness, danger constant, certain return doubtful, honor and recognition in the event or in case of success. So they put this ad out on all of these perils and all of these difficulties that they were going to be faced. Why were their men lined up to go on this journey? Is because they wanted to go with this man, Ernest Shackleton, and what they had heard about this man. What about us? This verse says, considering everything that's gone before about our Savior, the one who Jeff's been reminding us, we have the privilege and we have the responsibility to serve Him. What about you? What about me? I'm speaking primarily to myself here in considering this verse. How steadfast, how immovable, how abundant is my work and my labor in the Lord. These people went after that man, Ernest Shackleton, but we have someone far greater. We have a certain return. We have certain honor that's coming for us if we'll follow after these words. So I was impressed in looking at this particular verse here and taking apart these different words. And so my daughter always encourages me to have points upon the platform. And so I'm going to do more of an exposition upon this verse here. So instead of points, I have some questions that I want to ask you. Those three questions are this. As we take apart this verse, the first question is, how can I be more steadfast in spiritual things? How can I be more steadfast in spiritual things? Number two, what are the things that move me from being steadfast? What are the things that move you away from where you want to be or where you should be in being steadfast for Christ? And then my third one is, how can I increase my abundance in the work of the Lord? So we're going to look at those few words here as we look at this passage. Quite a few waters up here. So I'll go with this one. All right. Let's look at this word steadfast. Because we're really going to be encouraged here to be two things. We are to be marked by being steadfast. We are to be marked by being immovable. And then that's going to apply to things that we do. We're going to work and we're going to labor. And a lot of this verse, thankfully enough, the Word of God gives us more about the how to get there than actually the things that we need to carry out. That's what's wonderful about the Word of God is it not only gives us the prescription for what we are to do, but it tells us how we are to get there as well. God has given us the tools to be able to carry out these things he's encouraged us to do. So what about this word here, being steadfast? Well, if you look into the root of it, it has this concept of being firm or being settled in my purpose. We've been hearing about um, men who were or weren't uh, well developed in terms of their convictions, in terms of their purpose. And so the idea of being steadfast here is the idea that I am fixed in my purpose. I should have my eye upon the prize. I should have my eye upon Christ. One thing that's interesting about this word steadfast is it also has the idea of being seated, of 
having a spot and being there consistently. And I'm not only talking about physically, obviously, I'm talking about spiritually and morally. Do you have a place that is the place where you consistently reside? Sometimes we think about the word seated or maybe the word sedentary is even a concept for this, right? And that's not always a good word because you could confuse sometimes steadfast with stubbornness, right? Sometimes that's a good quality, not always a great quality. But the concept here is, do I have a place where I will be morally and spiritually as guided by the word of God? This is a hard one, but it comes from time spent with the word of God and time spent with my focus on the Lord Jesus. This word steadfast also means reliability. I'm going to talk about more that more in just a moment as well. For steadfastness, I was thinking about Proverbs 20 and verse 6. It says, a faithful man who can find. Think about a friend. Think about a brother. Think about a parent. Someone that you can always go to and you can count on them to be available to you. That's the idea of being steadfast. But you know, this word immovable is next in the verse here. And you might look at these two words and you might think, well, these are very similar. I need to be steadfast. Doesn't that mean I need to be immovable? Well, I would tell you that if we look at the passage here, the two words are very complementary. I think the best the way that I can say at the conclusion of my notes is that steadfastness can lead to immovability. So once I master the place where I'm going to be, if you will, once I get there, I'm not to be moved from it. One of them is the positive term, and the other one is sort of the negative term. It's almost the lack of a negative term. In other words, if I've picked a spot, if this is the spot where I'm going to be, then I won't be moved from it. And you can always find me here. More on that in just a moment. This idea of immovability, brethren and sisters, one thing that we need to get a hold of in terms of moving away from God's purpose or God's plan for us is that immovability understands there is always something working against me. There is always something in this world, whether it be the values of this world, it might be your workplace, it might be your college, it might be your high school, it might be the retirement home. And in this world, all of the values are working against the things that God stands for. We have the devil who's attempting to get into your head and to get into your heart as well. And he would just love to move you from whatever purpose you've had for God. You get done teaching your Sunday school class. You get done taking them out for an afternoon and instructing them in the word of God. And then you get home and you think, I'm just entitled to this or that. And the devil works himself right in to you and you think, I was doing so good for God and then all of a sudden I got distracted. Or maybe perhaps you're like me and you're driving here to Michigan and people pass you on the road. Maybe they cut you off. And you were doing so steadfast. And yet you thought in your mind and then something just slipped out. I'm not saying that happened on my way to the wedding <laughs> yesterday. They've really improved the potholes here in Michigan. I want to thank you for that. We much more enjoy the drive up here. <laughs> Immovability. I want to just relate this quickly to each other because the verse opens with this um, imperative. It says, brethren and sisters, I want you to be steadfast and I want you to be immovable. These are not just things as he's writing to them for them to consider individually, although that's entirely true. You and I will spend a lot of time alone in this world by yourself. And so, of course, our individual testimony, we are to be steadfast and we are to be immovable. But he opens by addressing this to the Christians, to all the believers. And I believe what he's helping them to understand is all of these things will have an impact upon one another. Let me explain what I mean. If Eddie here is always here in the front seat there, and that's always his spot. If you ever needed something from him, like for instance, you needed advice on what to do when you go to Ohio. Eddie has lots of good ideas. 
Well, if you came to meeting and you were expecting to ask him a question because he's very helpful, and he wasn't there in the chair that morning, maybe he was over there, well, he wouldn't be where you're expecting to find him. And so maybe perhaps it wasn't just that you needed travel advice, maybe you needed something more particular. Or maybe you're one of his friends here in the meeting and something just happened to you. You lost a parent, you lost a brother, you lost a child. You're having some challenges with one of your friends and you wanna to go to him or you wanna to go to someone here. Don't you want them to be in that place where you expect them to be? Don't you all have, we all do have that person you go to when just something happens and because they're steadfast and because they're immovable and because they're always available just to listen. This concept of being steadfast and immovable impacts not only us, but it impacts the others around us as well. Just went to a wedding yesterday and I was just freshly reminded by the fact that when two people come together in that relationship, so many of you know this, that your steadfastness, your work for the Lord and your spiritual journey starts impacting you and it starts impacting that other person. Bobby and Sarah Turnbull are starting to discover that in a deeper way even right now. And so this dependence upon each other, my steadfastness, my immovability, really impacts others as well. I always think about practical examples upon this, and so the person that came to my mind, as I wrap up these two words, the person that came to my mind was Daniel. So I think about Daniel for a moment, and um, what came to my mind was his exercise to pray. So you remember in Daniel 6, and I won't have time to read it, but in Daniel 6, it says that they made the decree about who they were allowed to pray to in the land where Daniel was at, in Babylon there. And it says that, you'll recall, Daniel went back home and he opened the doors and he prayed three times daily. And then I was amazed to look at the words that are right after that. You can look at it later. It says he prayed just as he had done from when he was young. One of the translations says, as he had done from early days. I don't know about you, but I had thought that, well, that was Daniel standing directly against what the government said he can and cannot do. So that must be immovability because he's not going to be changed from where he's at. But you know what I discovered about Daniel? I discovered he's steadfast because he had done those things even when it was okay. And even when it was acceptable, why did he do what he did praying three times daily from the time that he was young? He did it because it was about his relationship with God. But remember that when he was, I think most scriptures would say he was 17, in his teens, he would not defile himself with the king's meat. There's your immovability. The fact that he would not change, he would not be moved from his position to go where they would go. What's wonderful about these things, if you look at it closely, is there's 70 some odd years in between those two events. There's a life that's lived out in steadfastness and immovability when you consider Daniel. He was 80 or so when he was thrown into the lion's den. I asked a group of Christian kids recently to ask me how old Daniel was, and everyone thought that he must have been a teenager through the entire book of Daniel. <laughs> they weren't all gospel hall kids. But it was amazing to see his testimony in being steadfast in immovability. Speaking of moving, I need to move on to my next points. Let's talk about a little bit of the how. Because it says here in the verse here that we are always to be abounding in the work and the labor of the Lord. So what about this word always? Well, I think it means the concept that at all times and at all opportunities, I should be involved in what this work, uh, in what this verse is encouraging me to do. Maybe you've seen the Reese's ad recently, and the ad says, what's the appropriate time to have a Reese's? This is really appropriate because it's Easter time, right? So 
The question says, what's the appropriate time to have a Reese's? And he says, the answer is any time. And then the uh, announcer goes on to say, I would also accept all the time. I'm sure the Reese's people would be very happy if you were consuming a Reese's all of the time. But I think about those two answers. So is any time the appropriate time I'm supposed to be engaged in what the Lord has for me? No, I think the better answer is all the time I'm supposed to be involved in this. This is an incredibly high standard for us to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we're going to see in a moment, it's work. And we're going to see that it's toil and it's tiring. Those of you that are Sunday school teachers or who pick up kids or who visit people with the gospel, you know what I mean. It's not only hard physical labor, but it's mentally taxing as well. This idea of always means in all times or all situations, whether I'm alone or whether I'm together with others as well. Here's a wonderful thing about the word always in the New Testament. There are approximately 10 times, maybe slightly more, where Paul uses the word always. And do you know what it's always associated with? Prayer. It's associated with his thankfulness to the different Christians that he's writing to. You're thinking in your mind how that he says, I always mention you in my prayers and my thankfulness to God for you. So what about this concept of the word always? It starts or it is very closely linked, I think, with prayer, which is the time that you and I spend alone with God. So you're thinking, well, how can I always be involved in the work of the Lord? Well, this word always in the New Testament reminds us that prayer is one way that we can be involved in what God has for us as well. He mentions it to nearly every one of the believers that he writes to. The word always is attached to prayer, but it's going to be involved in a number of other areas that we can take a look at here in just a moment. I think about this word always and about being steadfast, and it reminds me that Paul was in a particular situation with Silas. And you'll recall they'd been thrown into jail in Philippi. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like my favorite situation to fall into. They preached the gospel to people. Not only did they reject it, which often happens to each one of us when we tell others about Christ, but they were then persecuted for it. And they're, lay, and they're there in the bottom of the dungeon. And this word always, I'm assuming, is running through their heads. Because they're singing hymns. And they're letting the gospel known. And if they don't have this concept of the word always in their minds, do we have a Philippian epistle? Do we have a man, the jailer, who comes springing? to ask that question, what must I do to be saved? And so in one of the darkest, deepest, you know, perhaps most depressing situations in life, the apostle finds himself in, there they are making the gospel known unto others, just because of this word always. They've got a hold of this concept that I now have the opportunity to witness for Christ. What can they do? All, that, all they have at that point is their voices. And so they're singing. And now we have the wonderful epistle to the Philippians because two men chose to sing. And the gospel came to the man who heard and then it came to his family and came to him a whole group of believers. So always. What about abounding? This is actually the same word, this word abounding. It's the same word that applies to the baskets that were left over when the disciples fed the multitude. There was overflowing, there was abounding bread and fish that were left for the disciples. There was enough to feed all the people and then there was enough left over. That tells me a little about what it means to be abounding in what God has for me. Now, one thing about this word abounding or overflowing, so you might ask yourself, well, does that mean I have to be 
preaching the gospel? Does that mean I have to be reading my Bible? Does that mean I have to be praying 24 hours a day? Or hey, maybe I get my eight hours of sleep, so does that mean, and then I have to go to work for eight hours, does it mean I have to spend the other eight hours with my Bible? Well, I'm not going to tell you that that's what the word or this verse means. But what I do think we could ask ourselves is this. When I think about the things that you do for the Lord or the time that you spend with him, instead of asking yourself whether I'm abounding in those things, maybe you could ask yourself this question. Am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? I could just go and sit right down now because the answer I can tell you is no. I'm not doing enough. Could I be doing more for him? Could I look at what I'm doing objectively and the time I spend with him and could I say that I'm abounding? And unfortunately, sometimes the answer is that it's not enough. Always abounding. I want to get quickly to the work because my time is going. You have to do these things by knowing. You have to do these things by being reassured of them over time. The little word knowing there means to discern. It means you've got to take a look at something closely, and it means I've spent some experience with it. I'm not saying this isn't for the younger Christian, but what I am saying is that the verse here teaches us that as as I experience God, as I experience him through his word, through life's trials, maybe through others' trials, I experience what he is like, and I know, and I am reassured, and I can look closely at God's son, and I can understand that he watches over what I do. Now, what about this idea of work and labor? Because my time is gone. The work and the labor in this verse, there's actually two words in here. So we might think, well, work and labor, aren't those the same things? No, they're not. The work is the actual things that I'm involved in. So it could be reading my Bible. It could be teaching a Sunday school class. But the word labor is the word for toil. Remember the disciples toiled all night and they had caught nothing. They were tired. It was morning. They had fished all night. I've never fished all night. I've done a few things all night. But I can imagine that if you fished all night and caught nothing, not only would it be physically taxing, but you would be mentally exhausted because you expected to catch something and nothing happened. Does God appreciate when we do things for Him? When we have a series of gospel meetings, when we go and invite others to come, and yet no one comes. No one got saved. He does appreciate the labor and the toil that went with it. I was thinking about those disciples that fed the multitudes that day. He told them to have them go and sit down to eat, and maybe you can correct me or there's more in the, um, more in the passage there that I'm not seeing, but I'm envisioning these men serving thousands of people, bread and fish. I don't think it took 20 minutes. You ever been to a restaurant and like two of the waitresses seem to be off that day? And one of them is scurrying all around to feed like 30 or 40 people that are at seven or eight different tables. And you think, why can't I just get a refill on my Dr. Pepper? (laughs) Right? How can she be that busy? He had them feed thousands. And they were tired when it was done. But can you imagine what stories those disciples must have told each other? Do you remember when we fed the 5,000? Do you remember the looks on those people's faces when we took the empty basket and we came back to the next table and the basket that was empty came back full? Does he appreciate the work that we have done? Now, maybe you're wondering what work is it that I'm going to do? I'm going to reference Hezekiah here. When you said Second Chronicles, I was a little worried you were going to go to Hezekiah. That's the most complicated name I have. I have my in-laws to thank for the fact that they got me a, a gift certificate for Barnes and & Nobles. And um, I went in there and I bought um, a Bible recently with larger print because now I need these. Um, and it was bookmarked to Second Chronicles chapter 29. And that's where Hezekiah starts to rank. A few chapters after Um, the friends that Jeff's been telling us about. And it says when Hezekiah started to reign, he did two things to start the work of the Lord. It says he saw the temple, and 
The first thing he did, he repaired the doors. He repaired the doors to the temple. And then if you look at it more closely, the second thing he did is they took all of the trash and all of the rubbish out of the temple. It took him eight days. But here's what I learned from Hezekiah when he had just started to reign and he was burdened about serving God. He did two things. He fixed some doors and he took out the trash. Are you wondering what God has for you to do? It doesn't have to be something monumental. It could just be that you could help around the hall here. There's a few people here that know how to fix some doors. And if you're one of those that knows how to fix the doors or take out the trash or do the landscaping or work at the work bee, maybe it's time to show some of the younger people how to do those things as well because they need to get involved in the work as well. I'm just going to leave you with this note because my time is gone. I very much appreciate it and I don't have time to read about the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, so I'll just ask you to go and take a look at it. He's tempted three times. He's told, or excuse me, his first answer is, man shall not live by bread alone, but on the word of God. He is being steadfast in feeding on the word of God. Then the devil tells him to move from where he's at and throw himself down because God will catch him. And the Lord Jesus says, don't tempt the Lord God. He says, I'm going to be steadfast and I'm going to be immovable. What's the third one? The third one, the devil says, fall down and worship me. And he says, the Lord God is the only one that you will serve. The only one that you're going to work and you're going to labor for is the Lord God. So what does that tell me? It tells me that our Savior has given us the pattern. In following him, we can be steadfast. We can be immovable. And we can be abounding in the work of the Lord. May we follow his example and may these few words be an encouragement to you as they have me. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the word of God, instructive and corrective and encouraging to us as well. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus who has lived out that perfect example. And most of all, our Father, we are thankful for his death for us upon the cross, for his body and his blood that we remember this morning. We give thanks for his sacrifice. We'd ask you to bless the assembly here in Stark Road and the various efforts being considered. And we'd remember, Father, those who need your care and help at this time in your presence also. Remember those who will be traveling for safety as we give thanks for all these things. We most love all give thanks for the Lord Jesus in his name. Amen.